live from SPNN, St. Paul Neighborhood Network in St. Paul, Minnesota. Glad to have you here. We have a special program today. We have a candidate for the Minnesota Supreme Court, Michelle McDonald, on the show today. And hopefully uh, a candidate for the appellate court will show up, uh, 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 switch in scheduling and uh, sicknesses and various things are coming up. So hopefully A.L. Brown will be able to make it. Uh, but if not, uh, uh, we'll, we'll go with Michelle. And so what I want you to know about well, how I do my, my, my show is an opinion show. You know, I have my opinion. So when I bring candidates on, it means I'm supporting them, you know, for office. And these are the people I think you should be voting for. Uh, so I want to introduce you to Michelle McDonald. Welcome. Thank Hi. you for coming on the show. Hi, Tim. And I think if Anthony doesn't show up, then I can probably talk a good hour. So. Oh, you think so? We'll have plenty okay. to talk about. Yeah, well, uh, running for the Minnesota Supreme Court, it's a big deal. It, it is. It is a big deal. Uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court's the highest uh, judicial office in the state. And that's where I expect to be November 6th. Okay. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, you know, let's start with legal background, I guess, uh, where you went to school and... Uh, well, uh, I was in, uh, I'm from Boston originally. I was born in Philadelphia. Okay. Uh, lived in Massachusetts uh, since I was three years old and then uh, moved here after law school and started my law practice okay. here in Minnesota. I went to law school out in Boston, um, Boston College and then Suffolk University Law School, uh, where I received high honors and moot court awards and everything else. Also went to the program of instruction for lawyers at Harvard in Boston, took the opportunity there, and moved to Minnesota uh, in uh, 1986, and that's when I started practicing law here. Okay. Uh, what's interesting, I, I see the paper says uh, you ran for the Supreme Court before. This is uh, now your third time? I have. I have. I ran in 2014 mm -hmm. and was Republican endorsed that year. And it was a pretty much a whirlwind. Uh, I, I was, uh, uh, I understood like many lawyers and Minnesotans understand that most judges are appointed. So I hadn't really thought about running. Mm -hmm. until about 2014 and then I decided to uh, take the large leap into politics. Again, I wasn't, I didn't consider myself a politician, mm -hmm. but that's, it was a lot of politics, I'll tell you that. that yeah, I it's, it's, a, it's a political seat, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's seat. a lot of questions about whether judges should be appointed or elected, mm -hmm. uh, but either way, it's a political decision. Somebody's got to make it. Right. And right. they make it for various reasons. Right, right. And obviously, you feel that uh, elections is a, uh, a way to go or a way that needs to happen. Absolutely. We have a constitutional right to vote for our judges. Mm -hmm. This I learned after I, the first time I ran. Uh, and it's being usurped um, by uh, the... Uh, our, I guess I, I'd call it, you'd call it a custom where what happens regularly every time mm -hmm. is that when a judge either gets in trouble and needs to leave the bench or decides to retire or take a different job, he actually vacates his seat and allows the governor to appoint a judge in his place, and then that judge ends up running as an incumbent, usually unopposed. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the upcoming election, there are 90 judges running unopposed. Wow. So that seems yeah. odd to me and almost fraudulent to me. Why would you be running if you're not opposed? And why would you vote for somebody? Your vote, does, they get one vote. They get zero votes and they're still going to be judged. So it seems like a faulty, false kind of a voting system. But the interesting thing about 
vacating the seat is that we could do that in other realms as well, senators, congressmen, mm -hmm. with other politicians. For instance, when Senator Wellstone died, he vacated his seat right. and the governor appointed a senator. Right. When uh, the, I'm, I'm forgetting his name now, Al Franken got in trouble mm -hmm. this last year, he vacated his seat mm -hmm. and the governor appointed in his place. So we could do that in every realm. We just pick on the judge realm to do it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating in that regard. Have you gotten any feedback or, you know, what, what is the street word on why people don't run against city judges? Well, um, I'm, I'm paving the way. I mean, um, other, people, AL, other A people have run against sitting judges, but they very have, few do. They have very few do. I, I feel like I'm paving the way because my experience uh, in, in running was met with a lot of resistance uh, from the powers that be, even the Minnesota State Bar Association. Um, in fact, it is said I stirred things up by running. So in other words, <laughs> this year. Uh -huh. I stirred things up by running against... By running this year? By running this year because there were four Minnesota Supreme Court judges up for, quote, re-election. They were all appointed, so let's get that straight. Uh -huh. And I ran well, against Well, originally, but some of them, some of them so. have been re-elected since. Yeah. Unopposed. Unopposed. Well, well, um, Some yeah. of them may have been opposed. May have been opposed. Yeah. Yes, true. but most of them unopposed mm -hmm. have been unopposed. That's so just by the way it is. <laughs> yeah, right. And the headline was, you know, I'm stirring things up just by running. Otherwise, they'd be like the other 90 judges and and run without opposition. So well, that's you know that's interesting because this is what you see happen in court for somebody who exercises their constitutional right. Mm -hmm and you as an attorney have a constitutional right to run for judge in an election. Mm -hmm. But sometimes what happens, like you're, you're charged with a crime, someone, and uh, you go, I'm, I'm gonna exercise my right to remain silent. Well, the prosecutor tries to use that against you. The police mm -hmm. officers try to use that against you. And so there's this culture of using our constitutional rights against us. Mm -hmm. You know, and that seems what's happening with somebody who's running for against a sitting judge. Right. You right. get punished for it. Right. Well, wait, this is a right. How can I be punished for a right? So in, in 2014 when I ran, uh, the Minnesota State Bar Association sent me a contract. And basically, I had belonged to the Minnesota State Bar Association for years, probably 20 years now. And I got this contract, and you almost feel compelled to sign it, but basically they said, we don't want you to talk about political issues. We don't want you to talk at all. Uh, we know you can because of the White case. Right, which, which was Greg, Greg, Wurzel, Greg was Wurzel's involved, case. Right? Um, but we don't want you to, so could you please sign here and not talk. Well, so agree, agree, sign a contract, basically giving away your con to not constitutional right of free Amendment, speech. First Amendment, free speech. Don't talk about judges, don't talk about the judicial system, don't talk about politics. And instinctively, because it comes from an organization that you're a big part of and supposed admire. To, supposed to be well respected. Well respected. I felt almost compelled to sign it. And then I thought, what happens if I don't sign it? And then I just didn't sign it. And I, know, I didn't get a call or anything like that, but I certainly didn't win the judicial poll. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the didn't Minnesota, even get to the vote Min in the judicial the Minnesota poll. Minnesota State Bar sends out a polling mm -hmm. amongst its members mm -hmm. asking who they're going to vote for right. for the Supreme Court right. or for the judge, the right. judgeship or the justice that's up for election. And you didn't even get a ballot? I didn't get a ballot that year. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. <laughs> 
And I think there are maybe 5,000 attorneys that belong to the Minnesota State Bar Association, something like that. Uh -huh. And only about 1,000, a little over 1,000 voted. So the, and, and also, it, it kind of feels like a conflict of interest if lawyers are liking the judges, endorsing the judges, just endorsing the incumbent. Right. For some reason, that doesn't sit well with me. I, I mean, I, I, lawyers love me, judges love me, but to uh, tout the, as the incumbents, uh, I'll call them incumbents, because that's what the ballot says, only right. these judges that they're incumbents do, that uh, lawyers are uh, like me and want me to be a judge, to me that doesn't make sense because obviously it's, it feels like a conflict of interest. It really, really does. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, like I've said many, many times, it's a government for the lawyers, by the lawyers, and of the lawyers, not mm -hmm. the people. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't seem like a feather in my, my cap, or should it be a feather in my opponent's cap to say a bunch of lawyers likes, likes her right. and wants her to stay in because she's the incumbent. She's there anyway. They're going to... So it's that. a political move by mm -hmm. the state bar mm -hmm. to... because they kind of know who, mm -hmm. what people will. Mm -hmm. They get a feel of the land of what they mm -hmm. like. and. Mm -hmm who they can have control mm -hmm. over, mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in a mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. And I'm, first of all, the, the qualification to run for judge mm -hmm. is to have a law degree, or to mm -hmm. have a law license, not just a law degree. It used to be just to have a law degree, and I heard that Learned some, it in the law is learned the it constitutional in the law. standard. And I really don't, I would submit to you that I don't think you should have to be a lawyer to be a judge. And that was I'd like written to change in the that. statutes. It, it used to be that way. Yeah. But somehow we, uh, it's become a government by the lawyers, of the lawyers, and for the lawyers. Lawyers have almost invaded every realm. In other words, um, you have a police officer. He's mm -hmm. usually not a lawyer, but I went to law school with police officers. Uh -huh, okay. So some of them are. And that's law enforcement. And then... Uh, if they want to um, feel that a crime's been committed, um, you end up sending them to a prosecutor who's a lawyer. Obviously, the judge mm -hmm. is a lawyer, and so is the defender that's a lawyer. If, the, it's, a, if it's a civil type action, you send it to a lawyer to send papers to another lawyer to bring to a judge that's a lawyer. A lot of our senators, our congressmen, are lawyers. I, I dis disagree with that. In fact, um, when I was helping with some legislation, cooperative private divorce and some other legislation with uh, other lawyers and other consumers, the consumers would say to me something like, well, you're a, I'm not a lawyer, but, and I'd be like, you know what? This is not a qualification. <laughs> this is not a qualification. I want to know what, because a lot of our laws just don't fit in with real life. They're not based in reality. There's not a lot of common sense to them. So to, if it's that complicated that you need a lawyer, so, so I really don't, I guess that's the roundabout way of saying that, the only qualification mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to run for uh, judge is to now have a law license. Mm -hmm. And I have many, many more vastly qualifications than that, mm -hmm. a lawyer being one of them, a lawyer for 30 years. And, but I just really would love to get back to just having the people like my clients on the bench. Mm -hmm. Juries don't have to be lawyers. No. So, and they're impartial decision makers. So, I guess I, I've thought about that. And, and so when the uh, uh, Minnesota uh, Lawyers Guild, I forgot what it's called now. <laughs> Minnesota they come State back, Bar Association? State Bar Association, when they come to you and say, <laughs> you signed this form, you didn't sign it, did they 
come back after you at all or? No, but I didn't get it this year. Oh, okay. <laughs> because what happened was, and I just really didn't think of it as, I just thought of it as, well, I'm not, just not going to sign it. I really didn't think of it as, I see it now as the, the, I'm an officer of the court, I'm a lawyer, I belong to this club, and I didn't really see it as them so, uh, pressuring me into keeping what's in the club secret or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I hadn't been that way all along. I've been very vocal about the corruption I see in the courts. But what happened was I ended up being on Sue, um, Sue's show with Andy Sue, Selick. Sue Jeffers. Sue Jeffers with, with Andy Selick. And we casually were talking about this, and Andy was, like, outraged. Yeah. <laughs> he said, they, they're asking you to sign this? I'm like, yeah, I, I didn't sign it. And so it became public, and I think that's why I didn't get one this year. Okay. Well, and this is what happens uh, when an association like that is attacked because the mm -hmm. U.S. Supreme Court says, no, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the court goes around about in a different way. We're finding this with election law. Uh, so, you know, the T-shirt the case or any case, uh, okay, so the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court says you can't do this. Well, then they modify the law to try another way around it. Mm -hmm. Less restrictive, but still restrictive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so I see that happening a lot. Uh, so you, 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 you got to go so back much. over. Well, the, the white so, decision, right, the, that's right. their, that was their way around, okay? Mm -hmm. Greg Wurzel gets to go out and campaign. He gets to state his position on thing, and he gets to raise money. Well, now they, but they go and say, well, you can only raise it in groups of 20 or more people, mm -hmm. and you can't be president mm -hmm. in the room. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then they start this form. They give you that form that you mm -hmm. have to sign mm -hmm. that says you will mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. So you willingly agree mm -hmm. to not. So mm -hmm. that's their way around the Constitution free mm -hmm. speech issue. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. So, so the bar doesn't want transparency. The yeah, bar doesn't want right. this openness. Right. Right. And they they don't. And as you may know, uh, and I'll bring this up. Um, I, I'll bring it up because there was a hearing today on it, but I, I, I don't like to bring it up because it's, it's very personal to me, but I'm uh, one of the only attorneys in the history of the uh, country and the world, and of course Minnesota, to have handled a court trial in handcuffs. Right. And when I reported the judge for doing that to me, to, for, for allowing that to happen in this courtroom, to the Board of Judicial Standards, he was on the Board of Judicial Standards. And this was back in 2013, the, in September 2013, when that incident happened, and in uh, December, I reported him, wrote a f quite a few letters. When, once he got cleared, which means that they didn't do anything, I got my Dear John letter saying... And he got cleared because of immunities? Um, well, he just got cleared. This was the judicial board now. Oh, okay. So they're actually right. supposed to look into malfeasance. And I would think that any judge anywhere in the country mm -hmm. that would allow an attorney to handle a trial while in handcuffs... Mm -hmm. with no file, no paperwork, no pen, no paper, and have this kind of fake trial mm -hmm. would, would be punished. Right. Um, something would wrong. be I mean, Something this, is wrong if they think sick. the machine can that's keep sick. going right. when there's an attorney that's under arrest in handcuffs for taking a picture or whatever even, they even, even arrested Even thinking that's for. okay to do that to an attorney. Right. I mean, that, you got to stop the case. There, at, I mean, at the worst case scenario, stop you the stop case. the case. You stop the case. And in, 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 in this case, what happened was they uh, brought me back to do the trial. He actually said, 
we want her back here, bring her back here. Oh, she's in handcuffs, I don't care, bring her back here. And I actually did the trial. And then the worst part is, 90 days later, he makes a decision based on that fake trial. Right. And I appeal that decision. And then it ends up being dismissed as it's about to go into mediation because the guardian claimed that they didn't get notice of the appeal. Right. And but they were already involved in the appeal. They got notice. It got served by eServe. They weren't even entitled to notice, in my view, because they had been out of the case. So right. it was, again... They weren't part of the case. Uh, they weren't part of the case. It was, again, covered up. And so it's... it's I, 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 I deviated a little bit because what I really want to say is that after he got cleared, he reported me in January 2014... February, something like that, mm -hmm. with, by a one-page letter to my lawyer's board. Mm -hmm. And I was investigated for three years. Right. So that's the underlying. I was being investigated privately by the board for three years. And, at that and they time, couldn't did, find anything. Did you know you were being investigated? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, in a way, I really didn't because I found it annoying. Like I would, uh, for instance, they wanted to um, look into my LLC, my Minnesota. And so I'd get a letter from them saying, could you please get Limited us. Limited Liability Corporation. Limited Liability Corporation. Could you please get us one of the forms that you filed for your LLC? Well, annually you file something that you're in good standing. Now you do it by e-filing. E okay. So it's like not like I kept a copy or anything. Mm -hmm. So the, the annoyance was, okay, now I have to send somebody down or go down myself, pay $8, get the form for them, and send it to them. And they're always, do it in two weeks, you know, or else. And then what happens with the board is if you're a day late, they automatically charge you with not being cooperative. Okay. It's a very punitive system, uh -huh. and it's a pro I didn't realize it, but they're prosecutors. It's a prosecutorial system, and it's quasi-criminal. I didn't know all of this. So I'm just kind of answering for two years. I'm answering them. They actually, I had a, a seven-day trial, and the only reason they got a hold of the transcripts of that trial is because I appealed it. Another horrific family law case, mm -hmm. um, the DaCosta file and uh, what, the, what the judge did, what the system did. Mm -hmm. um, the judges are just kind of part of this system and they seem to not have uh, a head on their shoulders of their own. Um, mm -hmm. They were in a machine kind of a thing. Right, and in the a courts bureaucracy. get that way. Very, yeah. and, and I remember getting a, a, a piece of a transcript. Now this is seven days of a trial and they wanted me to explain the argument that I had with the judge, the referee. Now this referee and I our friends, <laughs> you know, okay. I mean, we know each other mm -hmm. from before this trial, after this trial, and I just remember it was a tough day in court, and he, he just said something like, I'm done with everything, and we had a little interlude like you might normally do, and they wanted me to explain my little interlude. They didn't say it was there was anything wrong with it, but this is the, this is the type of, I, I would call it harassment that I would get. And I remember once, it was right before Christmas, I was ready to go on a vacation. I get this fax, and they want me to answer something. I think this was the straw that broke their camel's back, because I, I was just getting these notes, answering them, getting these notes, answering them, typing out why we had an argument, why I, from my perspective, I had an argument with a judge, which that's what we're supposed to do, right? We're lawyers, right. we make arguments. Yes, and a, and a judge can go and say something on the bench and you get mm -hmm. to correct them, mm -hmm. no, that's not what happened, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, judges ask clarifying questions and sometimes judges don't mm -hmm. get it, and mm -hmm. so you have to say things a different way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an interaction that goes on there. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, and sometimes the judges' mm -hmm. attitudes mm -hmm. are really rotten. Mm -hmm. They're just from the mm -hmm. beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, they got a bad attitude. Mm -hmm. Well, is that your fault? Mm -hmm. You know, no, no it, it may not be. You know, they're, they're responsible for their own attitude. Right. And how they're going to conduct their courtroom. Right. And so this trial went relatively smoothly. And so... 
uh, I re again, before Christmas, and I just remember, and they wanted it, and I was going on vacation. Now, I don't really like to tell the board. I do have a life aside from answering their <laughs> paperwork because I'm afraid they'll really enter. Oh, she's going on vacation, and this did happen. Mm -hmm. This did happen uh, on an appellate court case that I had that they pretty much wanted to ruin my vacation. And, <laughs> and, and they <laughs> do it kidding. to other people too. They, yes. So, and and you 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 think it's just you you start people tell you this is systematic. Mm -hmm. This is you're you're being targeted, and then you don't want to believe it because you're like you know why why would this how how could this this be uh, but anyway when i got this and it was like answer with it by such and such a date and this time they might have given me 7 days or something like that and i was going to wow. be gone and i just wrote a letter i said and i from a faxing over please stop harassing me basically huh. to the board and this is what i was representing myself i'm like please stop harassing me hmm. so it wasn't not had nothing it had everything to do with Judge Knutson's letter and nothing to do with Judge Knutson's letter because all he said in that letter was investigate her. And so everything move I made. And I'm thinking of myself as being so uh, pristine. Uh -huh. I was. I mean, I, I walked these lines so well for the last, what, it was 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was about 27 at this time. You know, I had my own law firm. I had lawyers. I had never had a malpractice case. Um, never had a, bo a board uh, uh, happen to me. Like right. never had right. a, um, anything um, related to me ha uh, happen with the board. Right. So, so I'm just but, answering, and and I got a little frustrated. Well, after that, it got worse. Huh. After that letter, and then I thought, well, you know, I do have insurance for this. I think I'll call an attorney to help me. And then after that, it got worse. So it just it was just like, are you going to leave me alone? So all, all this, this time, it just mm -hmm. felt like they were digging and digging and digging, not finding anything, not finding it. And it all came full circle three years or four years later to Sandra Grazini Recchi's case and that day in court and what the judge had said. And the judge came. I didn't, they didn't offer me any type of a plea deal, <laughs> you know, like, oh, we'll, we'll, uh, you know, we'll suspend you for, I wouldn't have accepted it, by the mm -hmm. way, but, uh, you know, 60 day suspension they, they or public admonishment. You didn't even have or, an offer. No offer. And usually offer, there is. And usually there is. Instead, that day, and they never said what they wanted. They never said, we want you to be suspended. We, we, we never told my attorney anything. So we didn't know, like, do you want me suspended for a year, 30 days? Do you want a public admonishment? There was no indication except we're just going to keep going with this. And I just can remember the, the hearing. And there was a referee there. And then Judge Knutson was on the witness list. And I said to my attorney, Judge Knutson's testifying? They said, yeah, they needed a warm body. So they had Otherwise, just, they had nobody to testify nobody against to testify. you. Nobody to testify. Okay. I, it wasn't a client, there was no client complaints. So they needed a warm body, and so that was who they had to testify. And then they also had... Lisa Elliott, opposing counsel in that case, oh, where wonderful. I was testifying. <laughs> so these are the two people testifying against me, and then they pulled the old trick where I was put called on the stand first. So even though I'm on the defense, I was on the um, you were offense. First. I was called first. And I talked about how I wanted to eliminate court. And I talked about it very frankly. And when you read the transcript, I think it's a masterpiece, actually. Hmm. But of course, they later on claimed um, uh, they wanted me to have a me mental health exam. Mm -hmm. And the uh, prosecutor, uh, uh, the board um, prosecutor, said, to the judge, we wanted to have a mental health exam. Which has, never been, like, which has never been a Problem? disciplinary measure for right. anybody, has it? 
N no. Not that I know of. No. I mean. I mean, what's that going to do? Right. You know, you're practicing law. You have no issues with your clients, and you're running a business and raising four kids. And I'm supposed to have a, you know, and I'm happily married, and I'm supposed to have a mental health exam like after the fact. What? Right. What's the purpose? So, and she, the judge, the judges were kind of like that. Well, why? You just had to hear her testify. You just had to be there, Your Honor. And I think it's because I just frankly talked about the corruption in our courts. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I'm seeing things that I guess they're not seeing. And maybe that makes me, to them, seem a little crazy. But well, they're the crazy ones. If well, they're not seeing what I'm seeing every day and my clients are seeing. That's interesting because uh, on, a, on one website, they got a quote from you, but... What I found out is you're not the only one saying this. Appellate courts are not doing their job in holding our judges and lawmakers accountable. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's a strong statement, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And then I start reading what other people running for judge are saying. And A.L. Brown, who's not here today, uh, uh, there's a quote. It says, and finally, an appellate judge must have the courage to tell its judicial colleagues on the lower court or its own court when its decisions are unlawful or unjust. Right. Well, why does he need to say that? Right. They must have the courage. Right. So something's not happening here. Right. But he wasn't the, uh, the other one. I read uh, uh, Judge Running in Ramsey County, um, and I don't have his piece of paperwork, but he's basically saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I could remember his name. Uh, he said the same thing. There's a problem with our mm -hmm. judicial system mm -hmm. in holding our courts accountable, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's why he was running for judge. So you're not the only person. Mm -hmm. And of course, Greg Worsell ran for judge. He was saying the same thing. So why are they all offended at this? Uh, I mean, I, I see that they're, they're, it, judiciary needs to be respected, mm -hmm. but they need to be respectable. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a two-way street mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. that they can't just, we got to cover up the bad stuff we're doing, you know, in order to look respectable so that people mm -hmm. will respect mm -hmm. the law. Mm -hmm. Well, I think people respect the law better if, the courts, if they do wrong, are held mm -hmm. accountable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I... I, uh, yes, and, and it's a system and not a, a justice system, because what, it, I've seen it over the years evolve into a system of injustice. So my baseline is you go to court if you're being deprived of your rights to your children, your resources, your liberties. Then when that deprivation happens, it gives you cause to go to court. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be afraid to go to court and say, Your Honor, I'm, uh, you almost, I can't wait to well, go tell the judge this. You should have that attitude. Like, I can't yeah. wait to tell mom and dad, you know, what brother did. I can't wait to go tell the judge because the judge is going to hear me. He's going to understand me. And then there's something that's going to be meted out. And instead, what judges think they're doing is when somebody goes to court, they're actually giving them their rights. Do you see the difference? Right. Okay, oh, you've been deprived of your rights with your children? Let's give you some in a trial down the road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? right, right. Um, instead of saying your rights are being deprived right now of right. your resources. Well, I, I got to tell you, Tuesday I was in the federal appellate courts and it was disgusting. It's uh, 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 Marianne uh, Calgaro case where parental rights were taken away by the county. The child was emancipated and the parents didn't even know. And a judge didn't do it, but the, the county did. And, but the thing that was so shocking was hearing the county and not only county, the school district, uh, health, uh, health organizations saying, 
the mother had no jurisdiction mm -hmm. to bring a lawsuit mm -hmm. against them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. How, how does a parent not have jurisdiction to bring mm -hmm. a lawsuit mm -hmm. over their own mm -hmm. minor child? Mm -hmm. Right, right. But Magnuson in district court said, yeah, no, right. parent doesn't. Right. There was no, uh, no legal standing here. Uh, I forget the actual terms mm -hmm. that gets used mm -hmm. in that situation. Mm -hmm. Failure to state a claim, mm -hmm. you know, and gave all these workers an excuse for violating mm -hmm. these parental mm -hmm. rights, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. It's, it's immunities, and immunities is a big right. lie. Pe people don't understand. You say, remember they used to say you can't sue City Hall? That was when I was a kid. You can't sue right. City yeah, Hall. But people right. would sue City Hall. Well, now you can't sue City Hall. Okay, it's called immunities. And immunities just means pretty much I can do whatever I want, and you can't sue me. Nah, 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 nah. Right. Okay, so what ends up happening is what the big lie as, is. As an official duty that right. they have. Right, right. And the big lie with is that the um, first of all they don't trust us. We're not going to go go around suing a judge or a public official that's decent, right? Right. Um, second well, of some all, people yeah, would, yeah, but. Uh, yeah, right. But the big lie is that the Civil Rights Act and 1983, which are the the leading places where you, they're intended, so that you can, if government gets abusive you can file lawsuits uh -huh. and get money and mm -hmm. get some relief. N nowhere there does it say immunity. Immunity is not found anywhere. Immunity is, was created by case law and by judges. It started with judges having immunity, which might make a little sense, but um, ultimately, anybody a judge appoints has immunity. And now we have statutes that say guardians have immunity, and parenting consultants are immune, and prosecutors are immune, by the way. And anybody who works for a prosecutor is immune. So all, it's trickled down, not just the third branch is immune, but like you can't sue, like well, that gets City into Hall. the executive branch then. The executive branch, and they have immunity too. So it's yeah. becoming a. So. Uh, uh, well, it's what I say. Judges don't have to follow any law mm -hmm. now, and they're mm -hmm. really a law unto themselves. Mm -hmm. And almost in a sense, by nature, a judge can make any decision yeah. they want. Right. Right. I mean, that's why we get five fours decisions and seven twos. And, but that's a little bit different than a judge blatantly violating somebody's constitutional rights. And, and what I see too is there's a conflating of the separation of powers everywhere. Mm -hmm. A conflating of it. Do you know what I mean by that? Not really. Okay. Uh, so um, the judges are supposed to judge the law, like if a law is unconstitutional. Right. They're supposed to say, you know what, I'm, I'm setting that aside. That's unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. And instead what they're doing is looking at it going, oh, the legislature says we have to do this, so we're just going to do it. And there's okay. some, there's some, right. That's, so mi that's some, Minnesota. That's Minnesota. I, I mean, well, that's I mean, what I'm familiar well, with. Well, that's what former Justice Paul Anderson said. Well, well we gotta, we got to look at the statute and interpret the Constitution in light of the statute. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's the other way around. But he said it. I've heard him say it mm -hmm. twice. Mm -hmm. And Jill Clark mm -hmm. pointed it out to him uh, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a Supreme Court hearing. I played mm -hmm. the tape. He says, no, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We interpret the statute by the Constitution. And if there's a statute, and this is a, it's called a Thiele case, and I've, I've addressed it and brought it to the attention of, you know, judges, and it's ignored. It's, it's a, a case where, um, I won't get the facts all right, but there was this statute or this law that said any, you had to be, just move. Like, it was like the trail of tears, but it was just people, you had to just move out of your jurisdiction. And it ended up that that case held for the fact that in interpreting statutes, right? Right. If a statute is, is, is contrary to law, judges don't have to follow it. Uh -huh. But that's not happening. It's exactly the opposite. They're not even analyzing whether the statute's contrary to law or not. They're they're first and foremost saying, we are going to do this A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. So that's why they, we, we end up with such um, abuses. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, and then another thing I mean mean by conflating is, well, now I know in at least one county here, if you pay a filing fee and let's say you pay the wrong amount or you get you get to have it back because you right. decided to unfile the filing, they need a judge's order to do that administrative task. They uh -huh. don't have brains themselves to say, you know, okay, I'm an, court, I'm an administrator. Oh, here's your money back. Here's the change. Right. Things like that. Uh, probation, too. That's an administrative function. Mm -hmm. But they're like waiting for the judge's order. So when the judge makes an order, ordering probation to do something, probation is administering a judge's order. So the judge is kind of overstepping his bounds into an administration. And then that person in probation is trying to follow a judge's order, see? Uh -huh. And they're dealing with, and then there's this third party over here that's the person on probation. So the conflating, do you see? Right. The judge, everybody's relying on the third branch. The third branch has been ignored but relied on mm -hmm. all of these years. No, mm -hmm. people don't vote for judges. They don't look, they don't watch shows like this to learn more about judges. I get calls. They want to know about judges. Uh, they're 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 um, um, they're starting to to people are starting to wake up to to pay attention to the judicial mm -hmm. branch because this is the most powerful branch. They tell the legislature what to do, right? Um, and and that's not it needs to be separated. Yeah, I see the legislature being scared of the judiciary when the mm -hmm. legislature has the power mm -hmm. to tell the judiciary what to do. Right. Legislature writes the laws; the judges have to follow them, mm -hmm. but. Uh, Okay, I got a, a question that uh, is really important to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm media, I'm the press. Uh, cameras in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you've had some experience with this. Mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. What's your op opinion on that? Should mm -hmm. cameras be in the courtroom or not? Is it a mm -hmm. constitutional right or mm -hmm. not? Absolutely, uh, cameras should be in the courtroom. Um, Yay! What, <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <Glad to hear. laughs> Yes, absolutely, absolutely. They're public places. So you can actually bring yourself into a courtroom and watch everything. Mm -hmm. But you can't watch it from the you know, luxuries of your home. You have to take a day off. You can't record it. I mean, in this culture, in this day and age, we should be watching what's going on in our courtrooms. They're pretending to be public, yet you have to take a day off of work to get there if mm -hmm. you want to support a, a friend. Mm -hmm. Or um, you have to actually leave a courtroom not knowing or trying to really remember what was said. Take a lot of notes. Right. And you can't record in the courtroom mm -hmm. here in Minnesota. In other places you get a record. Yeah. Buy an expensive transcript. That's five, the tips. Five to seven bucks a that, page. That's the tips that the clerks, the court reporters got. They mm -hmm. get paid to be there and ticker type or mm -hmm. record. And they also get a bonus. And they get very, very busy sometimes because a lot of people do want their transcripts. But it's very expensive, and it's an unnecessary expense because sometimes you just want to remember what the judge said. Right. Especially if you're an attorney and you're trying to write proposed findings, for instance, mm -hmm. about a three, or two or three day trial, mm -hmm. and you were participating in the trial, so you don't remember exactly everything mm -hmm. that happened. You're like a participant. You're not just taking notes. Mm -hmm. You have to buy the transcript for that. Mm -hmm. Well, you had an experience where you wanted a camera in one of your courtrooms and actually sued that your rights were denied from a public hearing. Right. Uh, right. And so, I mean, you, you've you stepped forward on that issue and put right. forward, but the court disagreed with you, you know. Right, right. And I think we were going not on the... Um, it was like the sixth, sixth Amendment. Right to a public trial. Right to a public trial. And basically, it was argued that there's no more brick, bricks and mortar anymore, that we have this technology. And it would be very easy to have cameras in the courtroom because we already have them in the courtroom. They're already in every courtroom. We have security cameras. They're in the federal courtrooms, mm -hmm. I found out they're today. In, they say they're not, yeah. but it's not even a security camera. If the federal courtroom is overflown, mm -hmm. you know, they'll set up another room mm -hmm. and show mm -hmm. a video of mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. video and audio, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. But you can't record it for public consumption, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, that's what public means, public consumption. <clears throat> so what they do in Minnesota now 
is, I, and I went to uh, at least one of the hearings on this that they had with the courts, and I heard both the pros and the cons about cameras in the courtroom is they decided to allow cameras in the courtroom only at the sentencing hearings. Like it's automatic. You can right. have cameras in the courtroom. And there were judges there opposing that mm -hmm. because they were saying, you know, your honors, at these sentencing hearings, a lot of times we're given, we're given these defendants a lot of loving. We're hugging them. We're wishing them luck. These are the connections that they're making with their right. defendants. Right. And to grandstand, which has been done, I think we've seen it done in the Grazzini Rocky case, right. um, when the cameras were allowed in that courtroom, mm -hmm. to grandstand and put on a public display, like uh, make the defendant, uh, you know, like a scarlet letter, and mm -hmm. it, that usually doesn't happen at those hearings. Mm -hmm. It's usually, if, if you've connected with your judge, your judge wants you to succeed. Mm -hmm. Your judge doesn't want you to be tarnished and, uh, and, and forever be a drug addict or a right. sexual deviant or a, the mm -hmm. good judges are there going, you know, good luck to you in your two years of, you know, yeah. <laughs> jail. You know, I hate to do this to you, young man. Your liberties are being taken away, but here's the law. It's a serious deal. It's a serious deal. So I got why they didn't want cameras. And then, of course, it ends up those are the only only cameras are going to be <laughs> in the sentencing. Yeah. So, so why would people want to watch the sentencing? That's like the end of the case. Don't you want to right. determine what happened during the case right. to determine why that person was sentenced? Right. Well, and, and a lot of these cases aren't even criminal. They're mm -hmm. uh, civil in nature. They're administrative. Mm -hmm. uh, you got professional judges. Mm -hmm. You've got professional attorneys. Mm -hmm. Uh, arguing legal questions, mm -hmm. no witnesses, mm -hmm. just legal questions. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with right. that being filmed? Right. And and now you're at a point where, and this really bothers me. I mean, I mean, this really ticks me off that we can't have cameras in the courtroom. Does it grind your gears, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just. <laughs> now you got a judge in Ramsey County mm -hmm. lets me film, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but another judge won't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what it's based on? Whatever they want. Whatever they want. Th right. Is that equal justice? Right. Right. Is that right. fairness? Right. Is that, no, it's an arbitrary decision made up on uh, the emotions or the logic uh -huh. of a judge. Uh -huh. Well, shouldn't the people get to decide that? And haven't we already decided uh -huh. that with the freedom of the press uh -huh. issue? Uh -huh. So... Yeah, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's some reasoning to it. it. It, it probably should be the general rule: cameras in the courtroom. But maybe a victim doesn't want to be filmed. I could see that, mm -hmm. and maybe that would be something that a judge would have a brain about and say, you know what, she doesn't. And of course, the attorneys he, would say, you yeah. know, that's fine. That's yeah. fine. It, but it has to be just something that's not be... totally prohibited. Yeah, you can block the video or something, but you can still have yeah. the recording. Yeah. You know, it's still a public trial, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. it doesn't become public. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, I mean, it's an issue, but there are 99% of the cases, yeah. in my understanding, yeah. there wouldn't even be a problem. Yeah to have a video. There, right, so. and, and <laughs> thank, thank God for you, Tim, because you do come out and you record these, these events that would just be oblivious, oblivious. I know you've recorded a few of my appellate arguments, right. even one more, more recently, mm -hmm. um, um, concerning a very serious issue, which is civil commitments mm -hmm. and the atrocities that are happening there. And you came out and recorded it. Otherwise, guess what? There's just a decision and right. a couple of briefs, and we don't right. really get to hear the arguments right. and then what the judges have to say, the questions that they ask. And if it wasn't for you recording those, um, those hearings, you don't get transcripts at appellate court hearings. No. Nope. So you'd never yeah. know really what was argued and what was said. And I, I just see it's uh, so Im important to have. And I think the judicial branch and the lawyers the state bar wants to have a public that's dumbed mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. that doesn't understand mm -hmm. how it works. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, that people mm -hmm. don't know their mm -hmm. rights because the it's bureaucracy. easier for them to operate. It's it's so so true, so true. Uh, now I want to tell you when I'm elected to the Supreme Court, every hearing that I do will be televised. <laughs> so I'll get my, my <laughs> well, wish. Well, they, they do. But yeah, everyone they do. is. They do. But, so why but not can't at the they appellate do? court. And why? Why I just not? found out the federal appellate court releases an audio oh. uh, the next day. Okay. Actually, or they may release it that day. So mine today will have an audio? Yes. Okay. The Eighth Circuit Court a of Appeals? Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. How about that? Right. All right. Uh, I think that's new. Mm -hmm. I, it's first okay. I heard about it uh, okay. Tuesday. Okay. And the one, uh, but here in Minnesota, mm -hmm. no. And mm -hmm. attorneys have asked for it, and the judge mm -hmm. says, no, mm -hmm. that can't do that. That belongs to the court reporter, right. or, you know, or whoever, right. you know. It actually doesn't belong to the state. Mm -hmm. uh, just bizarre answers. But. We're kind of, we got about uh, six minutes left here. You're kidding. The you hour guideline. went by? Yeah. And um, Anthony didn't come. So didn't I, come, I know he so, did. Yeah. Yeah. He did tell me that um, I, I would encourage people to vote for him and to re read up on him. He's another, another brave attorney that's, that is fighting the system. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I've paved the way for him, I, I hope. <laughs> so I hope we both get elected. He's, he's taught me that there has not been an opposition on the appellate court for over 10 years. He's the opposition. Here he is in a blank chair. Yeah. He's the opposition over 10 yeah. years. Well, now, Supreme I think, Court, I've ran the, the last Well, I know there's times, been so. a couple, uh -huh. uh, but again, it's only been one, I don't think there's been one for the last six years, mm -hmm. maybe four years, but um, I, Dan Griffin mm -hmm. uh, has run. But you know what? Time flies. It's uh, been 10. 16. <laughs> he researched it. Yeah, it's been okay. 10. Wow. Yeah, it was probably Dan 10 years ago. Well, so. and then a, another late, no, she didn't end up running. That's mm -hmm. right. She didn't run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Dan Griffith would have been mm -hmm. the last one. Mm -hmm. He got a high percentage. So Right, right. Well, thank you, Tim, for yeah. having me on, and I look forward to November 6th. Um, you're invited to my campaign party. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> With several of your guests. So. All right. Um, the, I, I want to go back to this because... You know, describe your family a little my bit. Family. I mean, even though, I mean, you're from a large family. I am, I am. So my uh, mom had 14 children. 14? In her, in her family. Oh, okay. My dad had 11, and okay. all of them married, kids, everything else. My mom and dad got together, had eight, so I'm the okay. oldest of eight. My youngest, the youngest was born when I was in college, and he's a physician now okay. working with my dad, who's over 80 and still a physician, uh -huh. Dr. Charles Lowney. So a very big, loving, and you can tell Catholic family, right? <laughs> okay. yeah. And uh, 27 uh, grandchildren. And, uh, uh, my, uh, two, and two great-grandchildren that are my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So it's just lots of love, lots of uh, colorful things happen. Mm -hmm. I know I know family and I know uh, I call it the colorful side, especially mm -hmm. my mom's side of the mm -hmm. family was the colorful side. My mm -hmm. dad's my dad's side was straight and narrow. They'd be doctors and lawyers, even though they grew up in the different. <laughs> my mom's side, colorful. <laughs> there was color in it, a lot of colorful. You know, you know no, none, not many of them went to college. There was divorces. There was, you know, drug use. I'm talking about my cousins, my yeah. uh, cousins' cousins, on that side. Of, so, so I know real life. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, raising four kids. It was a very colorful, <laughs> right. that's my nice word for, you well, know, there's ups and downs. And so it's real life. You've done a lot of family law. Mm -hmm. So in, in your judicial experience, uh, from my understanding of family law, you've got to deal with wills, trusts, estates, uh -huh. yeah. uh, the financial planning end, uh, so in the complexity of the family mm -hmm. law system, mm -hmm. you actually... 
had a lawsuit to say that the Minnesota statutes 518 were unconstitutional mm -hmm. as written mm -hmm. because it just denied a lot of constitutional rights. Right. Um, so kind of fill in the blanks on some of your legal experience there. Oh, I, I, for the first eight years, I was general practice. I, I just kind of fell into family law. Uh, but that's why I was such a good family law attorney and am because I know contracts, I know real estate, I know uh, all wills and trusts and those kinds of things. Um, so, so you're right. It, it unf I think it's unfortunate that that things are specialized. I don't think, I don't think the I, the, I don't think the judges, the judges have to connect with the individuals before them, mm -hmm. the family before them, and not uh, know, oh, I, I'm, I'm a specialty in family law, a specialty in contract. Mm -hmm. if, they, if there was a better connection between the judges with the individuals, um, it would be, be a, a, a lot more, um, I, pe people wouldn't fear courts as much mm -hmm. as they do, mm -hmm. fear going to court. And there's a lot of uh, bullying by lawyers as well. Um, before you even get to court, you're getting lawyers' letters that some of them are just very frivolous. Uh, people hire lawyers just to write letters, and lawyers can put the fear in you because mm -hmm. they have a lot of power. They have the power really to prosecute. And it's expensive. And it's expensive someone. and defend yourself. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question, but well, it's, it's just, yeah. Uh, basically, you got well. You've also done pro bono work gotten awards you want to kind right. of yeah I have five years in a row um, I, it's called the North Star pro bono award uh, it's either four or five years in a okay. row <laughs> All right. and well, we, yes we lots of pro ten bono seconds, work so. 10 seconds <laughs> yeah, okay I can't believe it. don't have time so, to talk about my yeah. all my pro bono work in 10 but seconds three, three years you've got an award for that yeah. uh, I think it's four or five years okay <laughs> in a row well thanks for coming on Michelle McDonald and Remember, folks, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week.